Well, Kyle. Yes, Garrett. Holminster Switch went from fucked up to fucking upsetting to fucking uplifting. I think it stayed kind of fucked up. <laughs> but more on that later. <laughs> well, we start in the bruise. How do you feel about cluttered vertical forests? Yeah, I like them. Ooh, I'm a big fan too. Not quite ancient. Well loved, you know, adjacent to a village. I'm just a fan of repeating vertical objects that are just so cluttered that as you look off into the distance, it just looks like anything could be hiding behind anything, anywhere. Bad news could be right around the corner. I just love the look of this whole thing. And they do, they, they have enough broken trees too that it kind of breaks up the monotony. I'm starting off with art rants, Kyle. I'm starting off with art rants because there's a thing I don't think Final Fantasy XIV does particularly well. And that's atmospheric perspective objects getting you know hazier or receding into the atmosphere of whatever color the sky happens to be as it gets into the distance or like utilizing fog and that type of stuff to really sell a sense of distance as the objects get further away from you the player's point of view and i say i don't think it's been doing a good job up till now because this dungeon and specifically what they accomplish here with the bruise just this opening forest area has some phenomenal atmospheric perspective i'm taking this photoshop here and i'm going to show you what i mean with my uh with my polygonal lasso tool this is real quick and dirty but it'll give you a good idea i'm going to cut out everything that is essentially in the foreground so everything i'm lassoing right now is the closest to the player and i think the game's doing a really good job of selling that because of the high contrast of the color values we still have fairly high contrast trees kind of in this middle ground as well as the actual ground that you would walk on but you can see that massive difference in the contrast and it's even happening with these rocks here we've got our foreground which is outlined in the red outline and this is our highest contrast of colors and shadow and then we've got our middle ground which is contrasted by the orange outline and then the background is is just kind of everything that's kind of like really pushed back from the atmosphere there's a really good example of this here with this tree that's in shadow because we are getting really high contrast highlights and this is from a sun shaft essentially i think this is from the shader in the game it's trying to simulate light coming through the leaves of a tree and so our dark here is really dark and our highlight is a pretty high contrast it's a lot lighter now if you look over at these clusters of trees here and here these trees have the same thing that's going on they've got light coming through, they've got an effect of the uh the sun shaft coming through the leaves you can see this here that, that's a lighter spot, that's a lighter spot, and it's even happening in these. You've got little dapples of light coming through. But the the difference in the color of the dark to the light is much more muted. Or at least my color picker. See, there's the darkest color on this tree and the lightest color on this tree. That contrast variance is so much subtler than what's in this. And, and, and this is really art nerdy of me, but I love atmospheric perspective and this is more or less why. And I think this is one of the best uses of it I've seen so far in Final Fantasy 14. This whole area is just expert use of repeating patterns of things that you recognize and then repeating them a ton of times to make everything feel encroaching, overbearing and dangerous because we're running down the path and you can, you can be like me, a tank in a place for the first time that just relies on the mini map because you don't want to look like an idiot. So you, instantly understand the boundaries of the world around you but i still got lost in the look of this it still looks like i could just kind of wander off the path in any direction and die a horrible death because as you go down that path there are actual egg sacs that we do interact with we get to see a bear transform before our very eyes and all these sin eaters come out and kill us but then you look around the edges and you're like oh my god there's so many egg sacs and and the way they just hammer home the narrative of this is horribly out of control makes it feel like right from the onset a complete lost cause it's wonderful the little hint of fire there in the distance through the trees the little patches of light getting caught in the ambient fog is just really selling the setting and this has to be the most linear tight dungeon we've played so far we have a merch store now to celebrate finishing stormblood kyle and i commissioned uh one sec Okay, don't fall. We got a glare there. Hey, so anyway, to celebrate finishing Stormblood, Kyle and I commissioned this piece of Valentuna. 
looks really freaking good. It's actually the best lighting I've seen it in so far. <laughs> yeah, so it's called uh, Tune In Val Out of the Storm. That's what we're calling this piece. And if you aren't aware of like what's going on in the Grinding Gear community, there's a wonderful artist by the name of Rosalind, and they sent in the first piece of fan art that we ever got, and it was freaking awesome. So we asked them if we could commission a full print for when we get to Shadowbringers. Well, we're done with Stormblood now. We're in the Shadowbringers. So enjoy this awesome piece of art complete with all three members of the Barking Triad out in full force. It's so adorable, I kind of just want to die looking at this thing. Anyways, you can access our store page by going to buyourbromance.com. That's buyourbromance.com to get a hold of our Out of the Storm print. Thanks. There is no room for farting off. There's no hidden chests around a corner. They're literally right on the path, the bonus chest that you'd run into. But the confines of the dungeon's path bleed into the surrounding little hills and allow you to think it's bigger than it is. And that's sold by the egg sacs that you are constantly engaging with and seeing on the edges. To me, this is like the highest compliment. When I wish I could get off the path and go and explore in any direction I wanted to, that's that's a chef's kiss moment for me. That's that's when I'm like, okay, great job with your environmental detail. Because I j And there's so many points in this dungeon where I would love to go off the beaten path and just explore. It's definitely a moment where the designers have to combat the players. I think of the Caverns of Time dungeons, which were just open fields, entire vanilla zones open to you. What happened? Well, you either knew where to go or you got horribly lost. Eventually, optimization takes over. So it's the right call on the designers end to do this. They also added in, and we've seen some of these little mechanics before, the web walls to make sure that players aren't over pulling or going too fast through the environment. Uh, maybe pulling more than they should and having a bad time, thereby resenting the game, even though, you know, you could have pulled less. It's a great opening moment. I, I don't know about you, but I already felt kind of like, damn, this kind of like shit hits the fan right out the get go. Where is this dungeon going to go from here? And you get to the first boss and you're like, oh, damn. All right, we're getting straight to the senior that killed or converted Tesslene. Purified, forgave, corrupted her ether. It doesn't seem at this point to be really related to good or evil or angels or anything of that note. For, for my purposes, I'm going to refer to the sin eaters as baddies because they're baddies. They're the baddies, Kyle. Oh, absolutely. And the game's naming system is reinforcing that, whether or not that's how ether magics and the background lore is actually functioning. For instance, the first thing we spy is forgiven dissonance. Mental conflict wasn't upset at some point. Like, do we read into this stuff? It flies down and a bear stands up and roars at it. Nice going bear. Lawful good bear there having at the enemy. Becomes forgiven conceit. Why? Was the bear conceited? Was, was it a, too big of a deal for it to roar? One big strike of Forgiven Dissonance Sword. This bear is an egg and thus converted. I love that those are the questions burning in your brain. It's important stuff. How this can a the, bear be conceited, Kyle? I think a bear could be very conceited. In fact, I mean, it, the first thing it did upon spying a more powerful Sin Eater was roar at it, after all. So you're saying it's conceited because it thought it stood a chance. Oh, this was like a 2-2 bear versus 4-4 four, four flying angel type. <laughs> it was going down. I don't know how it even blocked. It was some sort of other spell going in the works. The wolves become forgiven clamor. I guess you can see that clamor, you know, a bunch of wolves howling and barking all over the place. And then the scorpions become forgiven folly, which the folly of scorpions really can't help you out there. <laughs> they hide in too many boots and get killed? I don't know. Scorpions in Final Fantasy are huge though, so I don't know, they're not hiding in anyone's boots. They are. They're bulbous. They have those huge, huge tails just ready to inject you. They are definitely dangerous creatures. With this dungeon, there is available the support system, which allows you to run with NPCs who provide extra dialogue. Not voice, sadly, but of course, they want you to be a team player in their environment, so they can't make the solo play so amazing that it's required, and you kind of double back players and cause a whole issue there about who played the content correctly. But there are a couple of little, little tiny gems hidden throughout here, such as while making your way through the brews, through all these wild creatures, the Crystal Exarch says they swell their ranks with wild beasts, which suggests anyway that this is some sort of strategy 
that the Sin Eaters are employing, that they are aware that they grow armies, that they want to attack the village, or perhaps ultimately the Crystarium, and they're going to need to build that zombie wave along the way. The entire lead up uh, of this opening segment is dire. Things seem like, how could they possibly get worse? <laughs> We're being harassed by the very being that killed our friend or turned her into a horrible monster in the form of Tesslene. And it's the first boss of the dungeon, which just made my brain go, holy shit, where are we going from here? We're like, literally, this is the most upsetting thing that has happened in this entire intro sequence of going to find Alizé, then going to find Alphano, and then going to Holminster Switch and finding out the Lightwarns even exist. Although my brain should have went, oh yeah, Lightwarn, that's gotta be the final boss, you idiot. But I was still so upset about everything that went down with Tesslene at this point that seeing the Sin Eater responsible for Tesslene's corruption be the very first boss of the dungeon really felt like a mic drop moment from the designers of this dungeon. And the, also just the, the writers of this game going, oh hey, yeah, oh, this is the very first dungeon. Yeah, we're, we're going to make you fight a thing that really pissed you off and emotionally scarred you. Just, it's, our first, it's our first boss. There's two more after this. It's what Final Fantasy does so well. It one-ups itself. You get the answer to the thing you're curious about, and then they say, but wait, there's more. And here, it would be easy to assume through the main story quest so far, the angel archetype, the forgiven dissonance being the Light Warden. This makes it very clear. It's not. There are other issues at play here. And in fact, getting your revenge on this random creature is but a simple throwaway boss encounter. There's so much more to worry about. Yeah, it instantly just shows kind of the, the stacking uh, the threats on hand because this is this is a sin eater that Alice a was scared of. It was like, look at the size of that thing. This was a, a, a sin eater that really caused her pause. And then in our playthrough, we went through, went and hung out with Alphano and found out the depths of the depravity of everything happening in Yulmore and their allegiance or alliance with the Sin Eaters. And now we get here and it's just like, no, this is so insignificant that there are bigger threats beyond. Uh, here it is. This is just this thing that caused so much issue. It is simply just the first boss. It's got some fun mechanics. It's very busy. It does a lot of grid-based attacks, big waves, really making use of the wound, the circle that you find yourself in for this arena battle. Uh, it has a, one attack stands out called Thumb Screws, which is a line AOE attack with a safe area, suggesting torture, conversion, inquisition, those sort of ideas. A bit, yeah. And then we get into like uh, the self-flagellation later with further bot. This It's dark for being light-based villains. <laughs> it's dark. That is the dark side of purity, over pure, with your um, indulgences and that sort of thing of the past. It plays into that, and certainly the monster models looking like angels gives you that vibe. Whether or not that's how it's actually working with ether, black rose, and all these sort of other elements at play here. Yes, there's a lot to unpack, but it certainly does seem to at least uh, intersect with some of our our. Western, or Western sensibilities of how we vilify pure beings, or as you said, purity in a lot of our fiction. Yeah, one of my favorite personal storylines is the corrupt paladins that do too much in the name of good and therefore are oppressive and evil. We move into a segment or a section of the map called the Black and Meadow. And dude, this is such a wonderful cresting the hill moment which I don't think we've talked too much about. It's something I put a lot of stock in and other MMOs that don't have as many loading screens as Final Fantasy XIV. There's not as many actual cresting the hill moments in Final Fantasy XIV because of loading screens, but here we literally crest a hill. You, you down dissonance and there is a hill in front of you. But before you even go up it, we get a splash of like the first natural looking color so far. We see a grouping of green trees and a hill leading up, and it's a visual fake out. The, the green, it like looks inviting. We just went through also the type of tree. Like they're short, they're actually green. Everything we just went through were these massive monolithic vertical pine tree looking things. Their leaves were purple. It's a, it's a departure from that dangerous and overbearing feeling of the tall purple pines that make up the bruise. But then you walk up that hill, you crest it 
and you see the countryside and we are just uh, greeted by this roaring inferno of this just torched farm essentially this is one of the more impactful visuals i've seen come out of this game it really impressed me i went into a looked in explore mode and was taking a look at it and i was just like they they really nailed it here the hill you talk about also had npcs that came running over it gives a great human element and the more fantastic your story goes the more you have to come back to that human moment you come across manicured farmland but it's completely littered with the sin eater eggs and many of our forgiven deceits flapping about now we didn't get to see a forgiven deceit transform so i don't know what they were judging by the farmland it's a good chance they were like rams or sheep or something like that but they don't really look like that too much anymore. <laughs> Maybe they're people. They could be people, but I think there's a one-to-one -one on the people front that's coming up. Oh, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah, because there's also just loads of dead bodies. Uh, if you, even if you go back through an explore mode, these are these are just part essentially parts of the set dressing. Uh, dark dark way to put it, but they're they're there. That's an element I really like mixed with the fire because there's never any resolution for the fire, which puts it in the mindset of just panic. People running for their lives, knocking over lanterns, human error. There's two sides they could have gone with here. No bodies at all, which suggests full-on conversion, full corruption, 100% kill rate, and transforming into Sin Eater. But leaving bodies around leaves a much more open story about that panic and interaction, the story, the moment before, which is a really, really important thing in acting in general or any sort of video game storytelling. You want to be able to pick up what just happened. The simplest form of this is someone shivering when they're talking and you go, oh, it's cold. It's funny you mentioned the, the fire because I think I think that's the one thing that doesn't pay off as well as it could. It's the one it's the one visual in this like entire in this entire run through. I'm like, you could have you could have done a little a little bit more. I think the fire could have ended up being a bit of a uh, a cherry on top of this very well visually designed zone for whole Minster switch because we, we work our way down uh, the path and then back up the hill towards the burning village. And overall, I think the design's super clever because that, that village opens up into a big circle, which ends up being a boss pit, as, we, as we've come to find out. If you, if you pay real close attention, it, what looked like really clustered together buildings that were all ablaze and made it look like the entire village was on fire, they, it, they start to spread out as you get closer and you realize that they're all around the circle of, that eventually we end up having our big fight in. I wish the zone was darker i wish it had more soot and ash and ember going through the air for the whole thing it's kind of a nice daytime scene in the middle of this circle like there's well, they're no all daytime scenes you there, can't get yeah, <laughs> yeah but there's no crosswind there's a roaring we are sure. surrounded by fire and it's not affecting the visuals at all once you're actually in the middle here that'd be fantastic frankly i agree with you but tonally we are arriving on the scene near the moment of outbreak like, this has only just happened. A lot of smoke in the distance and none of it when we get there. That's a good point. That's a good critique. They weren't able to hold that up. That might be an engine issue. It may be just a work hours. Or it could have been a call. It might have been too visually busy for the boss fight. Who knows? But I sure would have loved to have just been surrounded by smoke or at least give me a little more amber in here. They're good with their particles. They're good. They love their, they love their particles. And that's actually something I forgot to mention the bruise. There's some nice little particles dancing around in there. Also, yaks. And more Switch Gremlins, which I'm, I'm still curious why the Switch Gremlins, the Gremlins from the Shadowbringers cinematic, aren't being attacked by Sin Eaters. They're like in league with them or something. I think what, in our what, what? comments, people have said that they are aligned with the Sin Eaters or the light in some way. Why? I don't know. I think it's just... Maybe someday. There's going to be a big side quest we do someday. All shall be revealed on the Switch Gremlins. The Yak, though, or Bull... Makes the most sense of all the names we've seen so far. Forgiven disobedience. Yeah, I can see a yak being a little <laughs> disobedient and being forgiven as such. That's extremely inaccurate. If it was forgiven disobedience, that should be a cat, sir. Well, let's get to uh, the main event of this segment of Whole Mr. Switch, which is, uh, well, we got to put down Tesla. It's time. The time has come, and they make sure you don't feel too bad about it because it's nothing but squawks and gurs from the former Tessaline. It's, it's, as I said at the top, it is upsetting 
she's gone. Like there's, there is no whisper of I'm so sorry or anything at this point. No, that, that messed up voice that talked to us as she flew off after the transformation out when we were hanging out with Alizé. That was it. That was the last, ba- last bastion of Tesla's humanity. That was it. Now, only a monstrous Sin Eater remains in kind of the same way that in my first run through, I was kind of dumbfounded that the first boss seemed like an important figure from the intro. And it's like, oh, we're just going to put down the Sin Eater right here, right now. And and how that kind of teed up this dungeon for me, being like, dear God, what's in the rest of this dungeon? Seeing Tesleen be boss number two kind of teed up the rest of Shadowbringers for me. Being like, oh, yeah, no, that was, sorry, that 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 emotional torment, that something to set your palate for what you're about to experience. So I'm like, oh, if we're going to put down Tesseline here, there must be so much more narrative. De-escalate that, right? Yeah, that was so day-to-day of this world that it's simply the middle boss, which is almost all, is the, is the throwaway boss, right? Like, you get the normal Shadowbringers boss battle music, nothing special here, no fanfare, just add put her down. As for the support duty, there's not a lot to gleam here. Alizé is quiet. She says, I'm fine, let's move on if Alphano questions her about what happened. But again, they had to make sure that one type of content wasn't more important to do than another type. The interesting line that I do like is what the Crystal Exarch has to say, which is, ah, your eyes tell the tale. Which is a nice little acknowledgement that the Warrior of Light might have been emotionally affected by this exchange. When it comes to Tesselin's attacks, they're still kind of in this torture purification idea that we got on the previous boss. The Tickler, which is the Tank Buster, Scold's Bridal, Exercise, Fevered Flagellation. Okay, yeah. Purifying of one's body and spirit. Yeah. In theming. These aren't necessarily names in lore, merely the names that would be given by the people if you were to read their monster manual back in the Crystarium. Exercise is a fun mechanic, too. The old stack marker with the four circle AOEs. It's a good fight, overall. Lives up to the emotional damage of what came before. Right, and shows that she is decently powerful enough to put up a fight and last quite a bit for four adventurers, and, and in this case, four main characters, if you do the support system. So that transformation of Tesseline was more empowered for reasons. Better than a bear. We head from the Tesseline fight pit into the village main, and finally I get a answer to the question, which maybe could have been assumed, but I wanted the answer all the same. What do people become? We see this massive brute of a monster, forgiven enmity. Maybe it didn't put on its tank stance or something like that. Big, huge Hulk. Does a slam attack, possibly a breath attack, and transforms several fleeing people into egg sacks before they emerge. Are you aware of the of the like you know at home definition of enmity? No, it's like a strong feeling of hostility. Oh, okay. So yeah, what this for- thing looks pretty hostile. What they're what they're forgiving here is would be like a hostile individual. We don't know what became this thing. This might be just the mayor or something like that. Who knows? But the people. This is where we get forgiving cowardice. The ones that we met when this Shadowbringers expansion first began. That's a person. Okay. Why does a person become a weird horse head thing? When scorpions become scorpions or bears become bears? I don't know. I don't know. Obviously, the name makes sense. Forgiving cowardice. They were running for their lives. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that because Tesseline more or less turns into one of these, but the face remains. Which right. I think is much more horrific. Oh, yeah. Why they have more of a monstrous uh, animal-like head, I I can't, I don't know. But maybe it's a reference to another Final Fantasy as things that I that seem lost on me so often end up being. But I want to talk about that final path, Kyle, because I already talked about how I think the village is a little visually uh, not what I wanted. You, did you want more fire? What is it yeah, you were hoping I, for? I want the fire to affect the surroundings. Mm. We're in the middle of all of it, and it's just like, oh, you want? There's no smoke. There's just no smoke. I guess there could be literally no wind, and the smoke just goes straight up. 
I want to, I want to go in and it gets a little dark and you've got like a, a side wind coming in. So it's blowing the smoke in one direction and you've got directional embers moving through that's helped selling the depth. Instead, we just kind of, it's like I'm hanging out in the middle of Disney World. Yeah, it's definitely a set that you are passing. There is an opportunity to do more, like have us move through a house would be exciting. Uh, possibly, of course, clipping cameras and all that sort of thing when you restrict spaces in an MMO. There could have very well been save citizens mechanics, but ultimately at this point, they've learned enough lessons to not make people channel things inside of dungeons together. I'm glad we haven't had to pick up a key in a while in order to <laughs> channel a door. Oh my God, when I get those old ones, man, not only do I not have my gap closer ability, but then I have to stop and wait and channel keys. Ugh, what is this? It's, it's, it's a realm reborn. That's the real answer. But I want to talk about that final path because the final, I, th I think it, it, it's easy to just be like, it's pretty trees as we're on our way up to the manor. I think it's easy to kind of see that as how it's going down. It goes back to the hill, man. It goes back to that hill. That path we're running up, we are now surrounded by those lying ass fake out trees <laughs> from before the blackened meadow. We're just completely surrounded by them. It's picturesque. They're still the color they should be. They're a natural gre golden greenish color. And it's sad. Everything we just went through, it's, it's basically, it's a reminder of what was lost in the areas we just fought through. But that element of hope does come into play. You've caught up to the danger because you see NPCs coming down the hill past you. And having decimated everything behind you, you know at least that part, well, should be safe. The field is still packed with eggs, but hopefully safe enough for them to get out. Yeah, and and we do end up like making it where the boss is, is a manor, and the manor's burnt out, so we, did, we were too late for the manor, but at least some people survived. In the support duty conversations, basically everyone at this point is talking about the ether. They can feel it. Their skin is prickling. They can feel the source of suffocating ether in the air. If you're magical, it feels magical around here. We crest that hill. We come to the manor house and jumping out comes the light warden. Jumping out comes text that makes me think of a FromSoft game. Text? Yeah, they put the name of the Light Warden and it's oh. in a serif font and it appears oh, and right. there's like two lines. Yeah, yeah no, I, I didn't really give it uh, notice. I was so busy being distracted by the chains, the tongue, the visage of this thing, which going back and reviewing parts of the lore in my book in the inn, this thing was in the image that we saw inside the children's book. Oh, so if we go look at that right now, we're going to see all the Light Wardens we're going to fight. Maybe. I went back and looked at it. This thing is really kind of mashed in there. You're like, what's with the two big hands and wings? And the f it really kind of gets lost in the sea of faces. Mm, yeah. So there might be things that we notice later looking back at that. But for now, this is very stark. This is definitely like center on that book with knowledge in tow. Mm, well, that confirms that the lion is definitely a light warden. Yes, absolutely. Gotta be. But also, Forgiven Dissonance was in there. This is the meat of the game. We are in early mystery period. Like in all your books, this is where we're asking questions. So we're not supposed to know everything right now. But my mind was immediately distracted by the name, Philia. Oh, Philia, Minphilia, is the Philia thing going on? So Minphilia is spelled with an F and not a PH, and Philia is, um, is actually a, a Greek reference. And I believe uh, okay. all the Sin Eaters uh, follow this naming convention. Or not the Sin Eaters. I believe all the Light Wardens follow this naming convention. Have you uh, have you picked up Philia's Triple Triad card? I know you love the Triple Triad. <laughs> no, I didn't know they had one. Okay, so Philia has a Triple Triad card, and the backstory on Philia is basically on Philia's Triple Triad card. Oh. The Triple Triad card for Philia reads, The Light Warden of Lakeland, the manacles which encircled its four limbs were whispered to be remnants of its mortal life. An elf once held prisoner within the hour of certain durance. Its name means brotherly love, and uh, it says Philia was the name bitterly bestowed upon the eater after it descended upon its home village and devoured its former neighbors. Woo, that's badass. Yeah, yeah. So I know, I know you like your obscure monster lore, and I also know you love triple triads, so congratulations, dude. This is your shit. <laughs> This is my shit. It's a nice, clunky model. You get to see something really kind of crawl around the space. And it's chains. While they don't, you know, intersect well or bounce, it literally doesn't matter to me. Like, I do not mind when legs clip through each other as long as you're going for something. And they went for it here. With the big mouth, the double split tongue, the angel wings still in tow behind it, and this kind of armored slat it has down its front. 
it's a really cool monster. It is a visage, to be sure. And it is a fight. This thing hits like a freaking truck. It lives up to the expectations of being the final boss of this dungeon. Honestly, everything hit really hard. I, 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 I hazard to say, I think the, uh, the village trash was probably the most clenching moment of this entire dungeon. Uh, but, but Philia, Philia came to play. Yeah. I remember there was a part where you fought two bears at once back in the bruise and you were uh, a little low health for some of that exchange. <laughs> hey, I got a lot of mileage out of blackest night. It made it a proper dangerous battle, which I was very happy to see. As for its ability names, a lot of them are head cruncher, pendulum, chain down, stuff about slamming, fierce beating. The only interesting one really is taphophobia, which is the fear of being buried alive. Which doesn't bury us? No, not really. Just a targeted circle AOE on a player. This is where things got difficult, even for people with duty support. This is where a lot of people were mentioning on release that this dungeon was beyond their means. I would love to get in a time machine and see this is what it was current. Yeah, well, think of all the big changes too. entire job changes that came into play. People who have played for a long time changing roles was definitely an aspect of, uh, you know, some difficulty here. But also things like the stamina system disappeared at the end of Stormblood. Like that lasted that long. It's insane to think that such a ingrained mechanic, something that would feel so foreign to us coming from World of Warcraft, still existed in 2019. I love the the narrative escalation of this dungeon. And there's 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 moments where it feels like it's letting up and and for me that was like that final little path. It's like, "Oh, this looks kind of nice." And then you 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 have to fight Philia. And it and then afterwards we, we get quite the narrative payoff. This feels like the end of the chapter. Like you go and you meet with Alphano, you go and you meet with Alize. My brain originally was like, cool. I've closed the book. I've closed. I'm, I'm done with the intro chapter. No, no. Hold Mr. Switch is where you close the introductory chapter because we actually bring shadow. We finally like really understand just how pointed, just how pointed the name of this expansion is. We, we bring night. We part the light sky. Also, we find out how the hell we are going to deal with the light warden. Here we are, the warrior of light, to suck it all up. Which, you know, I've seen the Green Mile, Kyle. You can't just keep doing that. No, no. In the past, clearly there were large efforts made to destroy a light warden. But upon killing it as you said, destructive, and also someone nearby, the killing blow perhaps, would become the Light Warden. This is a badass idea. I really, really like that. I'll be stealing it for my next DM game. A whole lot of body hopping going on in Final Fantasy XIV. Yep, spirits, ether, magic, inner will, it all kind of plays together here, and all that's on the side for you to enjoy. Death and rebirth. Yeah, this is a pretty simple equation here. You have the power, as the Warrior of Light, to digest excess light put it inside your bag as it were and nothing will possibly go wrong i'm sure it'll just work out yeah it'll be great <laughs>